Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Drew Schnur. I'm an assistant professor of composition and media at the University of North Texas. And we'd like to um, thank all of you for joining us today for our first Collaboration Hub Hangout and episode of Music Motion with the great composer, film composer, Daniel Pemberton. Um, we are excited to jump right in. Uh, first, though, I would like to introduce my partner in crime, um, Ollie Blackburn. Uh, hello, Ollie. How are you doing today? I'm very good, partner in crime, Drew Schnur. <laughs> greetings from London. Yes, greetings indeed, and greetings from uh, the Dallas area. <laughs> uh, so um, this has been a, a, a project long in planning, and um, Ollie, I'm looking forward to your conversation with Daniel Pemberton today. Would you tell us a little bit about, um, about this project and, um, and then get us to Daniel? Absolutely. Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Music Motion from me, uh, a new collaboration between UNT College of Music and Music Motion Labs, which, as you've seen, is me and, and Drew. What is it about music and moving image? And, and why is it that when you put those two things together, they have such a powerful and at times truly transcendent effect? Um, it could be a title from Star Wars to The Godfather to Seinfeld to Casablanca to Sicario or Frozen. But all of those titles bring to mind some very, very specific moments and associations. But while they're specific, they are also universal moments that have simultaneously been felt by hundreds of millions of people in, in completely unique ways to them. And I bet that the great majority of those memories also come with the thought, oh, my God, the music. So here's something that the, the great editor and sound pioneer Walter Murch once said. He said this. Music is the art that all others aspire to because of its level of abstraction. Music in its abstraction relieves film of its specificity, and the result is an elevation of both. Music gains from the specificity of film. It acquires more heft, but film also acquires something fantastic from music, which is this level of universality. It acquires an element of the tale and of the myth, and that is through music. So is that what is at work here? Well, music is abstract and it's infinite. And while film is specific, there are millions and millions of hours of film and TV to explore. So the, ask, the, the answer to this is both vast and it is what us at Music Motion are going to be exploring over the next months and years as we talk with some leading artists working in this very special intersection between music and image. And we hope that you will join us on this journey, which will be fascinating and uh, inspiring. So our very first discussion, our first episode, is with someone whose career appropriately covers every single facet of this intersection. Someone who's created music for film, for TV, for video games, someone who staked a name for himself across an amazing array of genres from action films to animation to comedy to drama, reality TV, cooking shows. He's worked on documentaries and he's created original songs. Uh, one of those songs, Hear My Voice for Chicago 7, was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, he's been creating music uh, pretty much ever since he was born. He released his first album at 16 years old, which was called Bedroom, and it was indeed recorded on a cassette recorder in his bedroom. And after working for years in TV, he then went on to have a, a remarkable career creating music for some of the most important filmmakers who are working today. He's done The Counselor and All the Money in the World for Ridley Scott, Yesterday and Steve Jobs for Danny Boyle. For Aaron Sorkin, he scored The Trial of the Chicago 7, Molly's Game and Being the Ricardos, for which he is currently nominated for a BAFTA award. He's done The Man from Uncle and King Arthur for Guy Ritchie. Uh, he's done the feature documentaries Phoenix Rising and The Rescue and animation films Spider-Man, Enter the Spider-Verse and the upcoming Bad Guys for DreamWorks. 
He is also the only composer who I know of who's had his early work forensically critiqued by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. And now, without further ado, it's my enormous pleasure and honor to introduce Daniel Pemberton. Basically, I think the best, best moments in cinema are the bits that like that hit you right here and they stay with you forever and you can't forget them. And you'd be watching a film and there's a moment that just connects with you in a way that that's, I call it the moment. There's a moment in the film, it's like, oh, here's the moment. And it's always working out in the film, what are the moments? Like, you know, what are the bits where you, you can kind of build the rest of the score around to make sure these moments land in the most powerful way they can. And they're the bits that I think where you your senses are heightened and you you see something in a whole different light and you look at something in a whole different way. Because I think great art is always about seeing the world differently or seeing um, seeing a diff like reconnecting with anything around you, looking at differently. And music is an unbelievably powerful tool for that. And you marry that with images and story and when it all intersects in the most perfect way music is like it's kind of like a dynamite that can just it's like a it's 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 like part of a chemical reaction that can just explode something into um like a power that's like almost impossible to top great um for all those out there this is our second go and uh we had some dynamite stuff in the first go as well we're going to power on now and i think we're going to go straight into influences and we're going to talk about one of your early influences and then we're going to get into how that impacted you as a as a young musician uh who started working with moving images so let's play the clip please to give thanks for the life of harold abrahams to honor the legend now there are just two of us, young Aubrey Montague and myself, who can close our eyes and remember those few young men with hope in our hearts and wings on our heels. You were talking earlier about the surprise at work in this, but uh... yeah. So I, I mean, so surprise is is like for me one of the key the key factors of what makes great film art, and great art, and great experiences. Is you go to something, you don't know what's going to happen, right? You don't know what you're going to see, what you're going to experience, and so the surprise is what is it's that's that's when you connect because you it's you do something for the first time so anytime you do something for the first time there's it's exciting because you you're, you're experiencing something new it's not as and I, I, my big problem with a lot of cinema these days i mean it, it is there's a lot of reheating i call it where it's like we're just going to give you what you've what you expect and what you're going to see before and there's a reason you get that because it works it's a really effective tool at making exciting experiences but the best experiences or when it's a surprise and the which is why you know if you look at like a tarantino film one of the things that's exciting about a tarantino movie you don't know who's going to die anyone could die at any point there's always the element of surprise in those movies whereas you watch another type of movie let's say like blockbuster movie you know that person's not going to die you know there's gonna be a big fight with a robot at the end they're going to hit each other and so you know what's going to happen before you go into the film sometimes and and so you watch it, it might be entertaining, but it doesn't stick with you. And you find the things that stick with you whenever you watch a film are often things because you're experiencing them for the f something new for the first time. And so with music, there's a lot of 
shorthand you can do where you're like, oh, here's a love scene, here's an action scene, and and musically, there's a language which you can use to convey those ideas. And that language exists because it works. And it's, it's almost like, you don't want to say it's cliched, but it's, it's the easy way out. But it's the way that works. But when you can find the way that's not the easy way out, that's a way that hasn't been done before, then as a viewer, you you suddenly go, hang on a tick. Like, if the music's telling me what to think, I can sit back and I can be like, oh, oh like, they're in love or something. And you don't even think about it. You just accept it. And um, when it's unexpected, it then makes you forced to think about what's happening in the scene. And then you might go, oh, my God, they're in love. And you're, by thinking about it, you're putting yourself in to the screen more into the story and into the characters because you're actually processing more what's going on rather than being told that right. and then it has a, a bigger resonance and a bigger bigger hit for me like and so i'm always trying to do that with music in fun ways of i mean it's, it's hard, hard to do it's easy to talk about but um it's, it's like how so do what you... what does this sequence say to you because you were saying earlier that you know this is a very traditional type of scene. You know, this is something you would expect. Very traditional strings, kind of, a very traditional type of British filmmaking. And yet it's got this incredibly modern, even to now, this incredibly modern sounding synth yeah. score. What does it's, that say to you? Well, it's, it's, it's a very brave and inspiring choice. And I think the thing with um, Chats of Fire is that people often... I don't say it's a joke, but it's become a cliche because you've seen that scene, but the scenes become so iconic that people don't even think about what the scene is and, and what the process it was that got there. I, I actually know way too much about the scene. We could talk about the scene for like hours, okay? But because um, it's originally Temp, the interesting thing about it is actually originally Temp with a piece called Opera Sauvage because I ended up chatting to Putnam's son and chatting like the process of it. And when you hear that track, you understand how Van Gelis got to that from that other track. Um, and, but what's interesting about it is on the surface, the, let's say the reheat way to do this film, which is basically an English period drama about some blokes running, posh guys running. I'm being very slightly sarcastic there, but, it, it's a, <laughs> uh, but, there's a way to do it that fits within the package of of a package of like how people perceive an English period drama. And by throwing this very contemporary music on top of it, which is not anachronistic, it totally works with the scene, but it makes you look at that scene in a whole different way. You like, you get the grace of the movement. You, you look at it in a whole different light. Um, yeah. And it stays with you. And it st like we all know that scene, and that is so much to do with the music. I mean, it's a beautifully shot scene, lovely titles, um, titles by John O'Driscoll, just to just give you like lots of random stuff about this scene. How much I know about it. Um, and, um, but it's the music because it's unexpected, and because it's it's something new. Like there's no, you know, it, it, it creates a memory within you and it creates an experience within you. And the really powerful ones of those stay with you for, you know, forever. Like, like probably all your life. Yeah. Well, you, you were saying earlier, you know, rewatching it, you hear that music, all that you ever think about is people running on a beach. Like that music, it's, it's like a, a Proustian like a memory trigger. And you were talking earlier about how, you know, like with, with the Jaws score, uh, that's what music can do is it can trigger very, very specific memories that, that, you know, that don't necessarily, as you were saying earlier, a shark doesn't sound like John Williams Jaws score, but from now on, that's all we think of. Yeah, I was saying like, if you're in a, like I say, if you're in a restaurant, or anyway, you'd be anywhere, you'd be anywhere you want, but you're like, you said to anyone in there, you don't know anyone, it's not like a filmmaker's restaurant or a filmmaker's restaurant. It's just any restaurant, anywhere in the world. Well, not anywhere in the world, but pretty much. And you'd be like, what does a shark sound like to anyone? After they got, they would, they, they would go, da -da, da -da, 
Of course, a shark doesn't sound like that. And, but that is in everyone's head. And it's a whole language that's been created by music and a composer, obviously John Williams. Um, and what's interesting about the marriage of cinema, of, of image and music within cinema, is how you can create these moments um, that, that we, you know, like it's, it, it's, you know, we have words for moments, we have, you know, words for luck, you know, words for happiness and all this kind of stuff. But music sometimes can convey a, a feeling or a state of mind that you can't really express any other way. You can't express a few words. And um, it's when you get those moments, I think that is sort of the highest point of being a, of a film composer. That's what I said earlier. It's like, like, I don't know, we said the alcohol stream room now, but I'm like, fuck the awards. Like, that's what you want. That is the ultimate prize. It's like, you do a sequence like that, and it's like, boom, you've won. It's like, that's all you need Great. to vote. Well, talking of strong and powerful opening sequences, we want to show one of your very early works now. Uh, and we want to use this to talk about your start industry and the sort of things that that you do at the very beginning. And, and this is from a show that you did called Bad Lads Army. And this is the title sequence of Bad Lads Army, which I think a lot of people will agree has a has a lot of similarities to Chariots of Fire. <laughs> or not, discuss. Anyway, let's play the clip. Take a look at the bad lads of today. Drunk, violent, out of control. Responsible for a third of all crime, 18 to 24 year old men turn Britain into a war zone every Friday night. 50 years ago, they knew what to do with troublemakers like this. It was called National Service. Fall in! Look like me! You lying, thieving scum! <laughs> I got every single so, uh, participant on on who was on that. I got the sound guy. Can you get them all shouting the word "oi"? I got a sample set. Got it. I might be able to find it on my computer. I got a sample set of like every single "oi." Uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to look for it now. Let's see if I can find it. Um, sorry, carry on. <laughs> I think it's an I think it's an extraordinary track. Um, it, I I always detect maybe a, a, someone we're going to talk about later in this uh, episode, but I detect a hint of Morricone in there, perhaps with the whistling. I mean, I, I mean, maybe I would say there's stuff I have <laughs> a, bit, a bit more Morricone esque. But um, oh, hang on, here we go. Here, oh no, it's not the. I'll never find the OIs. It's too many, too many OIs in my. If you type in the word OI in my sample library, it's like. Um, does, but does, how do you do something question? like this? This is a show where you're doing. I, I, you could tell me, but it's something like what fifty hours, sixty hours worth of of music. Yeah, I, mean, I was like, well, there was a period where there's a lot of like reality TV made in Britain. I was, I, I would work on anything. I'd be. Which I, I again, I actually slightly call the Morricone principle, where it's like you look at Morricone's career, he did anything. He just like, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And it just turned out like, like an insane rate. And some of it was amazing, some of it was a bit patchy, and some of it was a bit ropey, some of it was okay. But out of that, you get these moments of complete brilliance. And I always kind of felt that if he hadn't just kept like pushing stuff out, you wouldn't have got those moments of brilliance and it's it's sort of like if you have a band you know if you're a band or an artist there's this whole myth of like you've got to do the album and spend the whole you know spend three five ten years whatever creating that perfect work which is great and there's i got nothing bad to say about that but 
I think there's also something to be said about just making tons of work and just working all the time and then hoping some great moments come out of that. And they probably do where you, you force yourself into situations. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying I was taking on anything. I, any, anyone offered me a job, I'd probably do it early on. Um, and reality TV was becoming a, a it just, it, it wasn't even reality TV at that time. They didn't really know what it was, but it was this thing that was Britain was making quite a lot of. I was doing document, I was doing a lot of documentaries at that time. And mm. I would go into any show with a mindset of, um, how can I have fun? How can I do something I want to do? I would always treat it in a slightly, um, uh, I don't say selfish, but uh, self-indulgent way of basically like, I looked at each job as a way for me to try something out that I wanted to do. And I would try and find a way of convincing everyone that this is what they, what they wanted. So it, it, it meant, and I still do it in films in a way. It's like, right, I want to write some orchestral music. This needs an orchestral score. And I, and I, don't, I don't say that because I'll always do what I think is right for the project, but I'll have lots of things I kind of want to try out and I'll be like, oh, this is the time I could try that out. And with Bad Lads Army, you know, you've got this long running, like multi, multi episodic show. So you've got to write a big library of stuff for it. So I just went away and wrote tracks and I just done a very, I've done my first big orchestral score about a month beforehand. And that was a huge turning point for me, very important moment in my kind of career in the sense that I'd finally worked with an orchestra and I somehow managed to get through it, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And this was the next job afterwards. But what I want to do with this was go the complete opposite way and do the most lo-fi kind of make it all myself um, score. I didn't have a great budget. And I was just, I was just like, right, the show's a bit quirky. And it was an interesting time where as a composer, you didn't have the, like now as a composer, you have like samples of anything you want, really good samples. So you can kind of make stuff sound quite really professional, very relatively easy but when i did that which was probably like 99 or 2000 or something it was still the tech was still quite ropey and i didn't have a lot of money so i was just like i will just do with whatever i've got kicking around so right i can play the guitar all right ish i can't whistle very well but i could sample myself whistling and then i could try and get that like each note and then try and fine tune it with the pitch thing. And you would write in a way that you just do with what, what make, it's like kind of make do and mend. You literally just work with what you've got around you and just try and make this thing work. And that was really, really good. And so it'd be like, right, we haven't got the money for an orchestra on this, so I'm gonna use a kazoo. And I'm gonna put the kazoo over some beats and that will do the same job. And I remember the series producer was this guy called Meredith Chambers. And at first he was like, he wanted the music to be way cooler. He was like, I can't believe you're giving me these kazoos and whistling over these beats. He was like, we need guitars, it needs to be tough. It needs to be like, <laughs> like you know, like aggressive. And I was like, nah, like just stick with it. It's really good. And, and then pretty soon he was like, oh shit, this is really good. It really worked. And the thing was, was the show, the music, didn't take itself very seriously and the show sort of didn't and the show doesn't take the show doesn't take itself that seriously so it's actually a very funny show um but what the music did was sort of said we're, we're in on the joke as well and it taught me a lot about getting the right that getting the tone is the hardest and most important thing on any project it's like get the tone right for the project because it's the kind of thing if this is on american tv I don't want to slag off American TV, but that's literally what I'm about to do. You know, when someone says, with the greatest respect, you're like, you mean with no respect whatsoever. But the American reality shows, for instance, they're all like, everything is like hyper, hyper tension. So let's just see if I can get a crappy uh, string sound up here. Like, like on American uh, reality, and it's, you know, it's sort of changed, but they're always like, let's just get a little, yeah, it's all kind of like, it's all like sort of, and it's like 
They'd be like, there's a problem at the barracks. A oh, bad <laughs> And you're like, it's not a Hollywood feature film. It's a, it's a bunch of blokes running around a field getting shouted at by an army commander. It's a bit rubbish, like, but it's great. And so it's always about getting the tone right. So with that, I was just like, this is funny. I'm just going to play kazoo over this. And then it really worked. And then the show was a big success. And they made like four series of it. And it was really fun for me because those, it's still my ringtone. If my alarm goes off on my phone, um, plays the bad, like, let's just to see, look, if I, if I give this a two second on my phone. Oh, that, so that's, this is my, uh, I still use it as my alarm, my uh, custom alarm on my phone, so. <laughs> And it works, it's like. Um, wow. And, so, and the thing that's interesting about that, it, it was a time of where well, I didn't have a lot of resources. So I had, to, I had to be smart with what I had. And you, you wrote, like the trouble is now, there's, I almost have so many options. You often overwrite, because you're trying to like, oh, I can fill that in with this and this. But then it was like, right, I haven't got enough sample memory. So I can only get this much sample and I would have to come up with ideas that really work with a few, a few elements to them. And, and it, and, and it sort of hangs together quite well, some of that stuff. And it also like, weirdly, that was the first time I tried record scratching on a score, uh, which obviously had a huge impact later on Spider-Verse. We're going to move on and we're going to go to something. I can't think of anything that could be more different to Bad Lads Army. Uh, but, you know, you talked about TV and just the volume of work and trying things out all the time. And uh, and that brings you to your your first really big break in film. You've done films before this. You've done things like In Fear but, and uh, The Awakening. But your first really big break was for Ridley Scott doing The Counselor. Um, and... Um, I remember you telling me uh, that, that, that Ridley said to you one of the things he liked about you was that, you know, the old 10,000 hours on the clock concept, that you'd done your 10,000 hours and you, you knew your profession. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do now is actually show, show a clip, not, not from the council, but from all the money in the world and, and talk about this transition from this kind of high octane, you know, multiple, multiple hours of TV to doing, you know, a Ridley Scott drama. Um, so let's show the clip for all the money in the world, please. You told me that Paul and his mother had cooked this up to soak me. And I was wrong. All right, Paul may have talked about being kidnapped with his friends. He put it out there. He's not behind this. How do I know that you're not wrong now? These people are not the old world Malavita anymore. Their only code is profit and loss. They will do things to Paul that cannot be undone for any amount of money. We have to pay. This simply isn't possible. My financial position has changed. Really? I mean, 30 seconds ago, you said it was a good day. I mean, I'm not all that bright, but I can multiply as well as you. With oil up as much as it was this morning, you have amassed another fortune. Well, what if the embargo is lifted and oil were to crash? I'd be exposed. I have never been more vulnerable financially than I am right now. Mr. Getty, with all due respect, nobody has ever been richer than you are at this moment. I have no money to spare. What would it take? I mean, what would it take for you to feel secure? More. So, I mean, we, we mentioned this earlier. The thing that's really interesting about that scene is I scored that scene originally for the Kevin Spacey version of the film. And it was all built around Kevin Spacey's delivery. Um, and what's really fascinating on that project is the fact it's the only chance, only time I'll probably ever have in my life, and I guess anyone will have in their life, of scoring an entire film with an actor and then that being swapped out. And what's fascinating is actually looking at like actors performances how they're different like plumber plumber plays um uh getty quite differently to to uh 
Spacey. Like Spacey's Getty was kind of more what I would call the kind of what I imagine Donald Trump's dad was like, i.e. a bit of a C-U-N something. Um, and whereas, whereas Plummer's a bit more of a charmer, he's got more of a twinkle in his eye. And and they're, they're both, you know, they're both great performances. And they're, but they're both quite different performances. Really interesting when you've got the same script. And that scene was all built around, like, Kevin Spacey would deliver a line and he'd always end his lines. And the line is finished. Which, from a musical point of view, is quite exciting because it's a very definitive end. And so that's, that cue was all written around this delivery when he goes, how much would it take? And Spacey would go, more. Boom. And it was like, um, it was almost like a punctuation. So I build it all around this line. Whereas Plummer is a bit more throwaway and it's a bit more casual. Um, and it's, and it's a great performance. And it's, it's just a different, it's a different performance. It's really fascinating. And it's like, I would have, if I had scored that with the Plummer performance originally, I probably would have scored the, the way it the climax maybe slightly differently. Um, because, you know, you are reacting often to performances, dialogue delivery, um, and, you know, that's a very, and that, that scene in particular is probably one I remember most out of that film, of, of feeling like this is doing something different to how I was originally intending the music, but it was a crazy scenario, as everyone is probably aware on that film. I was with Ridley the day you broke. He wasn't happy let's put it that way <laughs> but i also think what he did like he's so badass literally and i think he secretly enjoyed being able to show everyone else how badass he is because everyone else has been like we're completely screwed he's like nah like i will sort this out and like he did and he he reminds me of some sort of like military commander military uh ridley in that he's he's got an amazing crew if you're with him you have to be like and he's he's really cool calm but if he says jump boom yes how high boom you're gonna go straight away and i think how they pulled off all the money in the world is a testament to everyone about his loyalty to him which he's, he's he really inspires that from people and and just be like let's get this done he's a real let's just get it done no faffing about let's just do it and um, yeah, and I think that was a, that what he did with the film there is, is is such an amazing example of that. Is this you talked about the deliveries? Is this something you find, you do a lot of films with very powerful actors? Most recently, you've got um, Nicole Kidman and uh, Javier Bardem. You know, do you find that your writing scores that are you know closely associated to the actors performances and their deliveries what you were saying their phonetic deliveries yeah i mean you're not like it's not like i'm gonna be well i don't know let's let's take let's take being the ricardo's for example so my early stuff on being the ricardo's i did it with demos where i was just playing the piano and i'd come up with this theme and i was like let's um so i i had done a lot of early sketches on a piano and sent them to the editor and we suddenly found that the piano just didn't fit really with the way the film was feeling in terms of the shots, the talk, like the dialogue. It just, it, it really got in the way. Whereas once you made it like a more lush wall of strings, it, it just, just sat really nicely. Abandon the car there? Oh, I sprinted the last 500 yards. What's going on? Also, you run with a bottle of champagne in your hand. Oh, bringing it oh, more faster. I got it. I got the part. Which part? I got the part. That's the big street. You said he was going to Rita Hayward. Scheduling problems. Then they went to Judy Holiday. Scheduling problems. I got the female lead in the big street. That's tremendous. 
it's always fascinating to work out like what's going to work in this film, especially with something like Sorkin's films, because they're so dialogue heavy. And you, it's easy to get, it's easy to like strip out identity from the music and just make something that kind of works. And the dialogue sits on top nicely, but the music is bland and doesn't have any identity. Um, and that's an easy way out and everyone's happy, but I'm like, I need music. Every film has got to have a really strong identity in the music, even if it's subtle. And, you know, I'll spend a long time trying to work out what is the palette of this film? What is the language of this film? Like the musical language, like most of Ricardo's is all based around the theme and it's all variants on the theme chords, the theme melody, um, in different styles. There's, like, there's actually a bunch of different themes in there. Um, and the same with, uh, Chicago 7, there's some very big scenes, but then there's some stuff which is incredibly stripped back, so you don't even want to notice the music. But if you do notice the music, you want to notice how it's all connected. Like, I try and, like, a good film score for me is where everything is connected and it pays off in different ways. And as we talked about at the beginning, the moment, it's like, what are the moments in a film? What are the key yeah. moments that you want to deliver? Um, for them to have the biggest impact. And the more you can seed ideas and concepts that can pay off in different ways, which we'll probably talk about when we look at some other scenes I've done, um, and have them pay off, that's when you get stuff that like, like really connects with an audience and connects with you as a viewer. Um, because, you know, I mean, look at any great film, it's, it's those moments when you, you sort of give, it's like giving someone a taste of something. And it's not always the case. Sometimes you don't need to do that. Like every film is different. But my favorite ones, you give someone a little taste of something musically and you're like, I want more of that. I want more. You give them a little bit more. And then there's a bit where you really get it. And you're like, yeah. yes. Like Mission Impossible well, or James Bond are great examples of that. Yeah. Where you're like, you, well, you, know, you want to. Sorry. But the thing where you want to hear the thing, you want to hear, and, yeah, and you want to tease people with it a bit, and then you just go, and when it comes in, you're just like, yes. Well, I've got to say, uh, I've seen a few composers, you know, give live performances. I've seen John Barry, I've seen Ennio Morricone. I think possibly the best was Lalo Schifrin, and when he played that Mission Impossible theme live, it just took the roof off. It was incredible. Yeah, he's a mean pianist um, as well. But um, on that note, actually, of these these motifs and these themes that you talk about, that brings us actually to our next our next clip and our next discussion, which is a clip from Guy Ritchie's King Arthur. Um, and it's completely, and this is what I love about discussing your work, Daniel, is is every single thing that we go to is completely different from the last. And uh, and you're just you, you're your exploration of these different genres is is really inspiring. Anyway, this is about as different to all the money as the world as you can get. And let's play the clip, please. Yeah, how, uh, the question I want to ask is, how do you even go about scoring and structuring something like that? I, I'm a filmmaker and I, I, can, I can't get my head around it. Uh, that, that was a very big dialogue with um, 
James Herbert, who is who uh, does all the guys editing. James is James is a um, really genius, inventive, um, uh, individual. Very creative, and always has great mad ideas. And he was the one who suggested the breathing. He's like, just do some breathing on it. And like that film was, as you know, quite a complicated process. I don't need to go into right now, but it was, it was quite a, a testing uh, production that one. And um, I'd often have to turn things insanely quickly. Like for the morning, I'd be like, now it's 10 o'clock here at night. It's a Sunday night. And I'd get a call from James saying, I've got an idea, Dan, how about this? And you didn't have time to like hire musicians or do anything. Just be like, well, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday. I, 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 and we need it from nine o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what? So I'd have to come up with things like, like on the fly and just be like, right, what can I do? Like, what have I got here? I was running out of, of, of stuff. I was like, oh, I try this breathing thing. That kind of worked. The screaming is me. I had to phone up my neighbors and tell them, like I have to be like, I have to be like, listen, I'm gonna be screaming like quite loudly for about half. <laughs> Don't get worried or call the police. Um, and we would do tons of sequences like that. Like, there's one where he goes to Darklands, and I was, it was like, when I'm talking about the Sunday night thing, it was that it was Sunday night. I was exhausted. And, you know, I've scored every scene in that movie about 70 million different ways, right? Yeah. Um, and um, we're like, all right, let's just come up with something new. And I was just, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I just got a microphone and just like, I want, I was thinking about, I want a sort of synth, like that. I was just like, oh, you know what? That will do. So I just recorded myself kind of making the score I wanted it to sound like. And then I just pitch shifted it, put a load of distortion on it. And messed around with it and now like in the film it's just me going wow, wow, wow. and it sounded great it sounded completely different it's something i would ever heard and uh it's a cool sequence and it, and that was like that's like i mean you know i love that cue and that is just me and james working backwards and forwards ah oh, he gets really excited i've got it down i've got it we need something else now some screaming or like come up with something or and you know, he came up with so many great ideas on that score, and I would just like, you know, he he, he was good at like pressing buttons in me, uh, uh, that would that would fire creativity and like, because I knew I could come up with a crazy idea, or he could come up with a crazy idea. We could do something crazy, and he would do something with it because he's a very he's an amazing yeah. editor and he's really good at working with these, these little bits. Um, and so that was just us backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and and then you get these sequences, and you know. Like he made, I mean, yeah, he made that sequence. It's an amazing, it's a great sequence. I mean, King Arthur is a really fascinating film because, as you know, there's some amazing moments in it and there's some less amazing moments in it. Um, but you remember that you, those few moments that are really out there, you definitely remember, which I think is in some ways yeah. a big success. Well, you know, one thing, it, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it was a famously complicated production, uh, but there is one thing that is highly consistent about the film, and in my opinion, is is the strongest thing, which is your music. That you know, you've got these motifs. That, that motif we just played there plays on in other sequences very powerfully. Uh, the the sound you just made, even you just saying it right now, is triggering in my mind exactly the weirdness and the sort of strange dark age weirdness of that sequence. And it's amazing to hear, you know, on a film as big as that, what, $150 million for a massive, yeah. massive film, that you're still doing your DIY thing in your bedroom, telling the well, neighbours not to freak out on a Sunday night. Yeah, for me, that's kind of what makes this stuff interesting, right? Because it goes back to this idea mm. of and unexpectedness. So I've done films with big orchestras. I've done, you know, like massive productions. And what I've found is it's great you can get amazing stuff i love doing the orchestral stuff it's it's so exciting and it's but it's you've heard it you know there's there's a bunch of people who've done it before have done it exceptionally well better than i'll do it and um you're not going to do as good a version whereas no one has maybe 
done many scores of them making stupid noises through a pitch shift pedal in a Hollywood film. And as a result, those things become more <laughs> memorable. And often, the thing, like I'm doing a score at the moment, and I should just show you. So I drink water out of this all the time. Yeah. Right? I would come water. And I'm just fiddling around with stuff on my desk. And I'm always just, if I'm on a phone call like this or Zoom, I'm always just, I have like a, a capo, which I'm always like fiddling with and just like sticking on my hand. Um, I've also got like a, a metal stick here, which is actually a whammy bar. And I was coming up and like, <laughs> Just, and I, I can demonstrate now if I drink water, but it's like. And then this film I'm doing at the moment, I was just like, I need to come up with another idea. This, this is lying around. And it's now in the film, just because it was sitting next to me. And weirdly, that might be more memorable than the 70 piece orchestra stuff we'll record, which sounds, which will sound great, but you'll be like, I know what this is, I've heard this. And. Um, I've really the one of the things I've really like sort of tried to lean into is don't be afraid of status of anything. Like don't we we give the orchestra a status, rightly so, because the orchestra is like sort of like the the you know, it's like the nuclear weapon, let's say, of um I mean it's very bad timing to use that as an analogy, yeah. but <laughs> it's it's the biggest kind of like thing in the arsenal um yeah but you know there's other things that are just as interesting and i like to give everything the same status and so i'll look at the orchestra in the same way i'll look at this bottle and for a certain scene obviously this might be absolutely terrible like if david if morris shah was doing uh uh lawrence arabia and the opening of lawrence arabia was it would be awful it would be a disastrous score and the skies of the orchestra makes that like this moment so epic but i don't know if it was like a quirky like drama like you know like i don't know let's say it's a chase down a, an alleyway in some t town or something it, like a modern kind of thing this would probably work better with a beat behind it um and be more unexpected and and it's trying to work out Right, it's a bit like, if you've ever seen Picasso's early drawings, like they're amazing. Picasso's early, he's just like, this stuff is amazing. And then he goes on to do his own stuff, which is equally amazing. But if you, oh, I mean, it's not equally amazing, it's way more amazing. But if you didn't know sort of art history, you look at one and you go, that person, when he was like 17, seems a really, really, really accomplished painter this person is making quite weird paintings and what i like is is that he's obviously decided to learn everything and then throw it in the bin because he wants to create his own thing and that's kind of what i'm trying to do is like i don't know what my thing is but i'm always trying to create my thing rather than what is expected of of film music or of of me and i think film music can do that and I, I, it's always more exciting when it's you know it is something unexpected well talking about that and talking about low status instruments we're going to show a clip now which is the ultimate which is a great influence on you great influence on many people uh and it's the ultimate low status instrument clip and and that's then going to lead us to discuss some of your work on, on Spider-Verse after that. So can we please play the, uh, the next clip, please?
amazing scene. <laughs> So I think the thing that's amazing, like the thing about that scene is like you almost have to go through the film for that scene to have the impact. Like if you haven't seen Once Upon a Time in the West, um, yeah, amazing, very long film, greatly aided by Morricone's amazing score. But you hear that harmonica riff a lot all the way through. Wow, 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 and you're like what is this what is this sound you don't really know it just seems like a an odd like a cool odd noise um yeah but it's only at that point at the film you suddenly realize why you're hearing it and it's horrific that moment is like like i say it's like one of these it's like the moment in the film it hits you like this and huge impact on me on that song in terms of like Taking something which is unusual, for instance, the harmonica sound it is is something you don't know what it is. So when you hear it, you're like, "What is that? Like, why? Like, if it was a a string line or a melodic line or a trumpet line, it would in no way have the same impact. But because it's unusual and unexpected, you um, it, it, you really pay more attention to it. So when that this end comes up and then you realize that's been hearing that sound out oh, and it's and then you're marrying this quite simple sound with this amazingly emotive um orchestration and like very lyrical very powerful it's it's like a it's like one of the great moments in cinema and obviously had a huge impact on me and i might have ripped it off the spider <laughs> i mean i was there ripped it off but I, <laughs> basically, I was like, I want to do a scene like that. I, like that's like a holy grail of like, I want a scene that's gonna hit someone else the way that scene hit me when I saw it in the cinema. Okay, so, we well, gonna... let's play Spider Verse. <laughs> Sorry, what were you about it. to say? Let's, let's talk about it first. So all through Spider Verse, we hear this sound. Of power, yeah, which is this kind of mad electronic wow. sound, which I um, I did with this. I've uh, got a friend called Brian Dugan's. Who uh, is in the Future Sound of London and also part of, uh, he made one of the most important acid house records called Stacker Humanoid. Uh, he's an amazing guy um, and a good friend of mine. And um, we did all these sort of synth jams uh, at his like crazy synth workshop um, when I was trying to write Spider Verse, just come up with stuff, feed things into machines, fuck about with them. And, and then we suddenly got this noise like that's what is that that noise yes that let's so we've got it in the jam it's almost and then i was like right that's gonna be a noise that's like such a horrific like weird what is that noise then i was like how can i like build on this noise and turn it into something musical um so all through the film you get this sound to represent this character but you don't even really know what the noise is it does a similar trick of like going what is this sound what is it um and it catches your attention and then this moment in the film, which you haven't seen the film, this is a slightly spoil a big reveal, but if you haven't seen the film, you should have seen it ages ago. It's a great movie and you would have seen it, it because is. there's no way in this in spite of it. So um, obviously the reveal when we find out, when Miles finds out that um, his uncle is the Prowler, is like his heart's being ripped out. And I wanted to use that sound and and do the same trick of basically like then turn what was a strange sound into really big emotive um uh track but the, the, the problem i had is it's not just you know in a sergi you, you the only movie everyone stands around for like five minutes while the camera just zooms in very slowly on their eyes or their boots which is great for the composer but unfortunately i was doing a movie where things change every 20 seconds and um so there's a big chase that comes so i had to find a way of trying to get the emotional impact plus the action of the chase uh plus you know keep a continuity with what i've been trying to create musically and this payoff and so we get a scary version of this prowless thing and then when it hits the first time i like push it like that as hard as i can into into the mix so it's just like so in your face and there's nothing else there and then it builds with too many instruments underneath it and it goes crazy 
So I guess well worth it. Hello, Mr. Fisk. I've got the security tapes from the tunnel right here. If the kid's out there, I'll find them. You know me, sir. I don't ever quit. And there's so many things musically going on there. I don't think I did too much stuff in there, but um, you know, it's that weird thing of like jumping from like big emotional moment to suddenly a chase, then trying to get the emotion in there as well. Cause you know, his, his whole world has just like swallowed him up and he's still trying to get away. Um, but again, that's like that once upon a time in the West scene had a huge influence on that moment for me in the film. That was a scene, even though it's a very different scene in some ways, it was, it's about a heartbreaking, heartbreaking, painful moment. And trying to um, emphasize that as, as sort of powerfully as you can. Because um, you talked about, you know, you said that you sort of ripped off most of my time with this. I don't think that at all. They're completely different things. Um, and yeah, you I talked like about the speed with. <laughs> but but you, I mean yeah I'm, I'm like it's any great any great work will inf you know will, will always influence you as an artist you know you see something you hear something you feel something it's really when you feel something you're like why did I feel that how can I make myself feel that again or make other people feel that and I like analyze what made me what made me feel that way? What got me excited about something? And or what, what, why did that make me feel differently? So you, I spend a lot of time analyzing why things do things to me. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go now to, uh, to a piece of work that you did for Aaron Sorkin, um, which is, uh, a very complicated piece. We've talked to earlier about Aaron Sorkin, about working with actors, about making the music suit the dialogue. We're going to look at a scene now from the trial of Chicago Seven, where uh, you're doing a lot of things. You're 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 showing the, the centerpiece of the film, uh, this riot and what actually happened in the riot. You're dovetailing it with uh, a, a lot of information from a courtroom scene. Um, there's a lot of different character journeys going on through the sequence. Um, it's Aaron Sorkin, so there's huge amounts of dialogue, and it's all really good dialogue that we all want to hear. Uh, there's a lot of action, there's a full ball riot going on, and then there's running motifs going on through the scene as well. So it feels about as complex as a scene could get with all the different emotional pushes and pulls. Uh, and we'd like to just play it, and, and maybe you talk through it, just identifying the specific moments in the sequence and what yeah, you were doing, and then you can get into more detail. Maybe yeah. if we play it, like, like I'll just say a couple of things about it. Like, what's yeah. interesting about the scene is like, um, when I did this film, Aaron had like very early on decided there were four really key music moments in the film, which is the opening, the ending, and the, the two riots. This is the first riot. 
and he wanted the music to really be an incredibly important part of these scenes to make them st like stick out impact which is which is which is a great directorial choice like you don't often get directors who are smart enough to realize that you hold the music back but you use it in the key points and originally these were going to be the only four bits of music in the film but we ended up putting music in a bunch of courtroom stuff because we just felt it was going to make it work better but for me what i'm trying to do in this is actually make the music feel incredibly simple and um I don't want you to think I'm being clever, like with the music. And I spent a long time trying to distill lots of disparate ideas into a few very simple ideas. Um, and with this, it was really about trying to capture the, the, the sense of this kind of protest turning into a riot. And it starts off with order. And that slowly starts to disintegrate as you get confrontation with the police starts to create tension against them and then that tension starts like the pressurizing and then it explodes into the riot and so musically i'm actually trying to like um emphasize those ideas and it's all for me it's like this is like a really key part of being film composed it's finding the story beats of like where do you turn where does where what do you do in a sequence? What do you highlight? What don't you highlight? What do you try and change tack on? What do you emphasize? What do you leave space for? And so a lot of this is about this thing growing and growing and growing in the same way the protests are. So I've got, you can play it and I'll start sort of shouting on top of it. But we start off very simple and it wants, you know, if you start at the beginning and go to the end, it feels very different. But I want it to build in a natural way. In the same way, any of these things happen with protest. It's like you go to protest, it starts off calm, and then it starts to, you know, like the tensions start fraying. It can go in a very different um, direction. It was time to confront the police. Marshals, we're on the move. So we're starting here, very little, like, it's just a guitar and a bass. was Mr. Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg, the poet? Yes. He was chanting a kind of war chant. Oh, What's he doing? Our He's calming street. the energy, settling things down. How's that street. working so far? Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! The guy testified that Ginsberg was letting out a war chant. Some kind of fucking jungle signal to beat poets that, that they should begin pelting the troops with blank verse. So a guy in the crowd is marching with a girl on his shoulders. She's waving an American flag. And this seems to really be bothering some frat brothers who come to town in the spirit of fraternity. Put down the goddamn flag! Put the flag down! Can you hear us? Are you fucking daddy? I know you can hear me. Here we get the first confrontation. So I'm gonna go back there and take care of that. They are not the enemy. In so many fucking ways, they are. Police are bringing guns. That is an escalation. So the music is escalating at that moment. The group turned left on 11th Street. We make left on 11th Street. And that's when they saw it. The crowd is still moving, but when they stop, the music stops as well. Holy shit. Now we have a standoff. So we've lost the energy of the bass movement, the guitar movement. What do you mean, fuck it? This is it. It's time. We're not rushing the police. What? The rhythm, the music starts up again. The riff starts up. We've got to turn this crowd around. There's too much momentum. We've got to turn them around and calm them down. What are we doing here? He's right. This is not safe. I know something about this, OK? Marshals, turn them around and slow them down. It's like the Alamo back here. Turn them around and bring them. There's no bass line in the moment because there's no movement. I don't think they're going to surrender, man. Keep it moving. Dave and I are going to stay and make Tom's bail. Back to the park. I don't carry money. Do you? Face for a joke. I'm a grown man. 
There we go. You're killing me, Alan. So, also trying to create dialogue space and emphasis on moments. Crowd are moving again. The bass lines come back in. So you're hearing the crowd move musically here. But now we've got confrontation again. I'm now moving. I've got like a low note, which is the bass. Using guitar feedback, a bunch of other things. And we have a low note, and then we have this rising tension scale on loads of guitars. The bass is pushing you towards this confrontation, which you know is going to be there. When you don't give protest as a place to go. How would you characterize the mood of the crowd? The witness is in no position to characterize the mood of a thousand strangers. Do you have an objection? Yes, sir. On what grounds? On those grounds. I will clear this courtroom. Mr. Wojcicki. The crowd was looking for a fight. You're pigs! Your children are pigs! Well, we should leave our children out of it. You're right, I know. You're right. White honky MFers get out of our park. And then he said... As this tension is building now, more and more instruments holding. There are no permits for this demonstration. You are ordered to leave the park immediately. Put down your guns, motherfuckers! Fight like fucking men! Just so you know it. I do not have your back on that. And the guys from Kappa Gamma Douchebag, who are hassling the girl, they're back. Put down the goddamn flag, you cunt! And don't make me say Put it down! Put the flag down! Put down! Put the flag down! Put the flag down! Put the flag down! Put the flag down! Put What? Nothing. That, that sounded nice when you said it. Right now! Yeah. Someone from the crowd shouts. A guy somewhere in the crowd shouts. Someone in the crowd shouted. Take the hell! Hey, hey, then explosion. The street name for chloroacetone for known is tear gas. Fire! And it's a fucking blowtorch. Your lungs, your skin, your eyes. Riot clubs? They're made out of the same wood they use for baseball bats. And you're also seeding the theme of the song at the end here. Scene in a way is, is all about trying to make it all feel quite natural and unscored. Like, there's this terribly crap phrase, it's like, Oh, good film music, you shouldn't notice it, which I, I, I call huge bullshit on. I, I think, yes, there's bits you don't want to notice film music and bits you do. And I think a good score uh, can be in your face, or a good score can be very discreet and subtle. But a really good score is one when you hear it away from the film, it instantly takes you back to that scene. Um, but with that scene, again, I wanted, I wanted to, in terms of score, I wanted it to change in ways that you don't really realize it's changing. You, know, you might think this is just some people banging some drums and playing some guitars. Um, but when you really break it down, there's a lot, there's a huge amount of decision making in there to um, support, re emphasize, um, um, enhance uh lots of the moments in those in that sequence um uh, yes it really i mean it's a, it was a like big sequence to work on and it's all about distilling it back to the simplest ideas because you can really easily overwrite make things bigger than they are and it, for me it's really about capturing the, the viscerality and the physicality of of that riot and that moment how many passes did you have to have on that scene? How many how many tries until you actually felt you nailed it? 
Um, weirdly, not that many. I mean, the thing that's very good about working with Aaron is if something's working, like you get some directors and they will give you notes whatever you do. Um, uh, but with Aaron, he will, like, if you like something, it, you can hit it out of the bag first time. And I've done that a lot of times. I mean, with, with, with Chicago 7, that was, you know, I'd spend, I will spend a long time on that sequence. So it's not like I'll just knock it out and it'll work. I'll be like, shit, I'll watch it a million times over and over again, trying to work out how to change it. And then you, you crack it, and you get an idea, and then you do it, and then you're like, this could be better, this could be better, rework it, rework it, rework it. And you do that a lot. And then you might present it, or you might show early sketches, um, um, but I think, you know, that was a pretty much like, I, I think the biggest thing with that, 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 that wasn't working for him was the, I made the riot to, I didn't put any emotion in the riot. I just made it chaos. I made like crazy feedback, guitars going loopy and he wanted something to capture the sort of tragedy and the, the emotion of it, which is where we ended up bringing in the kind of strings and the, the melody. Um, but yeah. We, uh, there's not a lot of passes on that whereas the opening the only that film i probably did about 20 passes on you know and it's very funny you get some cues where you will you know you might nail it straight away and there's others or you, there's others where you think you've nailed it straight away and and you and the director it's not what the director wants and it's the director's film at the end of the day so i'm always i will always push for what i think is right mm. if i think the director is wrong I will push back to try and explain why I think something's wrong or why I think something is better for the film. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is what you do is good for the film. It doesn't matter whether it makes, it's not about making you look cool or you look good. It's like, what is the, you know, it doesn't matter if you put loads of work into a piece of music. If it's not working for the film or it's not helping the film, then it's not right. And, and I think that's the most interesting thing about the collaborative process is like you've you've all got to be in there all working together for for one purpose which is to serve the film and make the film the best it can be um but i'll always respect you know like the director has a a vision on the film and i might i might have a different vision sometimes and i've got to understand what their vision is for the film and try and help them achieve that and sometimes that means they'll have a different instinct for scenes than, I, than I'll have. Sometimes we are totally on the same page. And sometimes I'll have to bend to their instinct. Sometimes I will try and bend them to my instinct. Um, and great collaborators have respect for each other. And so I'll always respect, you know, if it's a director I work with and I, I respect their opinions, um, I mean, you would always, you'll push both directions you'll be like right what what is working here and and but then they it's their film and they're the ones who've like spent 10 years or whatever making this film so you've got to you've got to get them on board and keep them happy with what what you're doing but you've got to push them as well it's like you've got to people don't hire me to do the same old shit every time and that's good for me because it means I work with people who want different stuff. If I think if I did scores that were all the same, people would hire me for another one of those scores. I think. Well, I think if we've learned nothing from this conversation, it's that you get hired for a lot of very different things. And that's a great point to to start taking some questions from the floor, I think. Right, so um, we are going to bring on some UNT students, Daniel. Uh, these are students who are um, experienced, aspiring film composers themselves. They're really excited to uh, speak with you. Um, we'll bring on um, our first student here, uh, Victor. If you could introduce yourself, uh, say hello to Daniel, and um, let's, uh, let's engage a little conversation here, a little uh, student yeah. seminar. Go ahead, take it away. Yeah. Hi, I'm Victor Granados. I just graduated from UNT, and it's such an honor to meet you, Daniel. Hi, Victor. How are you doing? Doing great. I've been... Congrats. Um, Congratulating. I'm sorry? Congratulations on graduating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember being particularly struck by um, Into the Spider-Verse. I remember hearing 
um, some turntable with the orchestra and hearing sort of like a scratching the orchestra kind of sound go down uh, when I was watching that movie. And that's what I walked out of that movie remembering. Um, so I wanted to know if that was something that was your idea you brought, because you, you brought up scratching earlier on in this interview, if that was something that you brought to them as your composer idea? Yeah, I always really wanted, like, again, this thing I, I, I might talk about earlier is like, mm -hmm. there are um, a whole bunch, like, I'm always absorbing music and there'll be things like, oh, I'd like to do something like that one day. And scratching, I, like, I used to go to hip hop clubs in London I remember seeing uh, Scratching for the first time as a kid and just being like, wow, this is... I remember, I remember just being blown away by his record scratches. And just being like, fuck, this is so cool. This is such an interesting musical form. I'd love to use a, somehow find a way to do a score that was all record scratch, like everything was scratched in. And it wasn't really till Spider-Verse. I tried a bit on Bad Lad's Army, weirdly. But it wasn't really till Spider-Verse I got the opportunity to do that. And I wanted to find something connected with Miles um because you know miles like i want something that represented kind of like for me like brooklyn hip-hop culture which like miles miles as well was very steeped in um but also like find uh, find a, a different musical device and language and what you said is great because everything i've been sort of talking about is you went to that film and you remembered something and you watched something and something stuck with you and it stuck with you because you hadn't heard it a million times if every film has record scratching on it you just be like, oh God, it's more record scratching. This is boring. And so it's that thing of hearing something new, which is why you connected with it, because you were like, oh, this is unusual. This is unexpected. And and that's, you know, that's, it, it's, it's lucky when you get to pull that off because it's quite hard to do. So I'm very happy that it touched you in that way. Um, but yeah, I, I took it to filmmakers. That was like a big early, big early idea of mine. I had very grandiose ideas at the beginning of trying to record the entire score and then re-scratch the entire score in. And we did a bunch of tests that were incredibly complicated <laughs> and time consuming. And it didn't work how I wanted it to, um, but we still ended up doing a huge amount with that. And like early on, I was trying to look into how could we scratch in Atmos. And I ended up chatting to technical people at Serato build uh, these kind of like modern scratching um, record scratching systems and we actually had people look into it and it was so complicated it was like because I was like if we record an orchestra and we have like 10 different mic positions can I scratch the brass section separately like I was like trying to look if, can we record a scratch on the brass and we can we then reapply that scratch if we save it through this software, because there's a lot of stuff where you can um, do stuff to digitally, could we save that scratch and then apply that to every other aspect of the uh, score, i.e. the strings that might be recorded separately, the um, percussion, all the different mics, and it was an absolute head fuck. And we tried to work it out, and then we were just like, this is, this is never gonna happen. And then we went back to stereo and working in stereo, and again, Going to this thing we talked about earlier, it's like, I think there's a lot of stuff in music where you're told everything has to be big and prof professional and like the highest end. It has to be the biggest studio, it has to be the biggest room, the most amount of musicians. It doesn't. It's like the stuff just make, if it sounds cool, it's cool. Like this, I should check this out. This is an iPhone. This is a very broken iPhone. This is my old iPhone that just kicks around here. It's not my current iPhone. I've, recorded one of the scores one of the cues in yesterday the Danny Boyle film was recorded on this iPhone on voice memos and it's in the film and it sounds great and it's just me playing guitar on voice memos <laughs> and we went and recorded stuff in orchestra we recorded you know we were at Abbey Road we did a lot of professional like pro stuff but there's a cue that is literally recorded off this broken iPhone um on it has got it's got a cool mic and that's in the film and it's a big Hollywood film and um, I'm sort of going off on a weird tangent here, but um, so yeah, just use anything you can, like uh, to make things. Because don't don't think having the best sample libraries is going to make you stand out. Right? Yeah, it's, thank you. That's exactly what I have been 
really excited to get to explore is whatever I can fuse together. I think a lot about the idea of fusion of maybe different things that come from different genres, fusing them together. And as you mentioned yeah. there, it, it brings up a lot of difficulties with figuring out logistics of something that's so differing from each other, bringing them together. Yeah, like, I'm a big fan of putting things together that shouldn't go together. Or I'm not saying yeah. shouldn't go together, haven't been put together, because that's when you create something new, for instance. Like, for instance, there's loads of people who've written brilliant orchestral music, and there's loads of, let's say, great Acid House records written on a 303, okay? But there's not many that have a 303 with an orchestra. So you could write some mediocre 303 music and some mediocre orchestral music. You can put them together and you'll make the only piece of orchestral 303 music, which means it's the best piece of orchestral 303 music. It's the only <laughs> piece that exists. And that's kind of my uh, like approach is like, right, I can't be good at these other things. But if I put two things together and I'm the first person to do it, then at least I'll be the best because I'll be the only person. It's like running a race when, when you're the only person running in that race. Yeah, create your own playing field there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, can I just say, I would love to hear those tests that you did, the, the insane Mad Professor scratch tests. Victor, do you have another well, question? They weren't, they weren't very exciting. It, was, it didn't work because basically... Yeah, we couldn't make it, we couldn't get it working like very efficiently because the thing about scratching, right, is it's like, it's like rhythm. So if you have like, like a clap and then you have something else clapping on the same thing, if it's all in time, it'll sound cool. But if it's a tiny bit off, it starts to sound a bit clunky and it just started sounding clunky, basically. So I had one more question that was more geared towards um, my audience and the people my age, of course, is, uh, in this position of aspiring, um, if there's any pitfalls that you would say you would want to warn that kind of crowd about, maybe decisions that um, could lead to pitfalls in our career or early on kind of decision making. I would be try and not, be, don't try and, don't try and be someone else like, it's a very easy thing to say, it's like, find your voice. You're like, oh, great, thanks very much. That's really easy to say, but it's really hard to do. It's very easy to um, people to expand that about, but it's true. It's like, find, find something that's unique to you. Sometimes that is like, I think the hardest thing now, you've got so much equipment at your disposal that that becomes, there's always an easy way out. Whereas when you have very little, like, again, if we go back to Bad Lab's Army at the beginning, if I was the same composer as I was then with the equipment I have, like all the equipment that's available to me would have been available to me at the same same time, I'd have probably scored that differently. It probably wouldn't have been as good. And um, because there's an easy way out, which again, I liken to when a, when a, a rock band does a film score or like a pop band, you know, like a, a sort of non-film score-y, person doing a film score. I think those scores are really fascinating because they're both sometimes brilliant and sometimes terrible in equal measures. And but what's interesting is they haven't learned the language that you learn as a film composer of, of shortcuts to do things of like, oh I can express this with this chord and do this and that's an easy way out. And they'll try and invent ways because they haven't learned the shortcuts. And Sometimes those things won't work at all and be totally misguided. But sometimes they'll create something that's like totally unexpected and really interesting. And I think what you should try and do is look at not of staying away from shortcuts as often as you can. Like I'm as guilty as everyone else. It's like I will I know how to get out of this scene, I'll do this, this and this. But let's say like I've done a TV series recently. And like, um, I try to do it in a very lo-fi manner. And I, you know, there's a whole palette and I banned the use of any strings, like no strings doing any pads, anything it has to be like lo-fi samples that I've made on a cheap Casio sampler. And if I can make it work on that, that's acceptable. But you're not allowed to get yourself out of trouble, which I could get myself out of trouble anytime by some nice 
it would sit under a scene, the scene would play perfectly, everyone would be happy, but it's a cop yeah. out and make the score more predictable and more grand because I used a shortcut to get me out of trouble. So, so yeah, don't use, try and find, try and keep your way, yourself away from shortcuts. If it sounds like someone else, then it's not very interesting. And if you can do something yourself that sounds like you, that makes you th like if you do something that sounds like second rate Hans Zimmer, a director can hire Hans Zimmer or, mm -hmm. you know, one of the people who work, the many people who work for Hans Zimmer uh, to do a Hans Zimmer type thing, right? But if you do something that sounds like you, they can't hire Hans Zimmer to do that because they can hire you. And yeah. that's, that's what you want to think. I always think Mika Levi is a very good example of a composer who we, we all know who she is and she's done it not a great number of scores but they're always very interesting and stick out and she's you know she's unlikely to be scoring Shrek 7 or Fast and Furious 22 um, but um, you'll be remember her her scores and she doesn't need to do those things and it's it's that's a great example of someone who's found a voice that is you know i'm still you know i still don't know my, my i've sort of got a voice but it's all over the place. i keep changing it so um you know, it's easy for me to say this it's hard to do in practice i think that's some great advice yeah should we uh should we go to our next question yeah, let's go on to, uh, thank you, Victor. Let's move on to Ariel. Uh, hi there, Ariel, would you, uh, would you introduce yourself and uh, let us know? Looks like your camera might be a little out of focus there. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Not at all. Going to be up. There we go. There we go. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, let us know your uh, question for Daniel Pemberton. Hi, I'm Ariel Glassman. I'm a master's student here at UNT, um, and it's a real honor to get to talk to you over uh, this Zoom-like video chat. And I think there's no more idealistic uh, image of a film composer than um, a million instruments in the background, <laughs> sipping on a single malt and fiddling around with uh, different stuff on your desk. Um, I don't so I'm drinking working. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, ask about, um, you talked about a lot about how you think about creating uh, film scores and, you know, trying to create these iconic moments and all these and trying to find something new at all times. But I was wondering how your approach to composing music changed, if at all, between doing original songs like you did one for uh, Trial of Chicago 7. Um, uh, title sequences and um, and incidental music. So I'd say all of those in some ways, like it's a good question because a lot of those are weirdly quite similar in a way in that like working in TV, like when I started out working TV, like I did tons of title sequences and that taught me the importance of creating a sound world that was recognizable and an identity very, very quickly. So you might only have five, 10 seconds and it's like, how do you create a device or devices or sounds that instantly connect you with this show. And there's loads of ways of doing a title sequence that just says, here's a title sequence, dun, 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 boom, here's the end. Which is like trailer music these days. It just goes, here's a trailer, do, 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 boom. And it's unmemorable. You forget it a second after you've seen it. Um, so it's like, what is the thing that can encapsulate a whole series a whole show a story whatever is how do you encapsulate that in a few uh musical phrases or words or whatever that's going to be um and that weirdly can be huge amounts of work and i normally what i'd normally do is i'd be working on the score for a long time and i'd probably be experimenting and then i'd start finding sounds that i felt were like more popular to me as a writer but i like that sound i'm going to use that sound more for that approach and as, as, as you sort of feel your way through a project, you start to, I mean, sometimes you go into a project and you're like, I know what I'm doing straight away. But often, if you're doing something even more unusual, you're just feeling your way. It's like sculpting and just 
moving stuff around until you get the right thing. And then you start finding good stuff occasionally. And you're like, that's really good. That feels like it encapsulates the, the, the story. I want to play on that more. And then it's trying to capture like the, the ideas that, that you feel make the show recognizable straight away. Like a great example, right, is Mandalorian by Ludwig Goranson, which is a really, really good theme tune and it really annoys me how good it is. <laughs> The thing that's really interesting about Mandalorian is Mandalorian has a whole bunch of hooks. Um, it has a few noises, ding ding. It has the drums, it has the tune. It has like three or four different elements that are with you within about 10 seconds, which is really, really impressive. And they're all, they're all woven into the score. And so for me, that kind of approach to, to um, themes and songs is, is really key so if you look at like other, i guess the songs i've done like hear my voice i wrote I, I wrote that song with celeste and then i kind of retroactively fitted it into the score because i knew we were going to when i knew we were going to end on that song i then took the melody of that and then reworked the score so the melody was through the score that's an example of having an idea that works and then you're like how can i support this better how can i like restructure the film um, I, I did a film called Birds of Prey and the song in that, Jokes on You, came out of the score. And that was a score element that was her kind of breakup thing. And then we turned it into a song. And again, you're, you, you'd be using the same harmonic language or sounds as the rest of the score. So it starts to feel a lot more natural. Um, but again, it's, I, I think a song is a good way to look at like how do you encapsulate an idea in a few phrases or the simplest way possible. Was a score is that you've got like a score is like a you know eight part Netflix series where you've got loads of time to faff about and get all these ideas across. Whereas like a song is like you've got to tell this whole story in three minutes. So I don't know if that's actually a good answer, but it's a sort of long winded. Well, that's a stuff. great answer. Yeah. But I'd be like find the things that make it unique. So if you're trying to do a title sequence, if you're going to do like some strings that build to a crescendo with some drums behind them, it's probably not gonna be very memorable. But if there's a great melody in there, then it will become memorable. Um, or if you've got like an unusual sonic palette with no melody, it might become memorable because mm -hmm. the sound in itself is fascinating. Um, but the best ones are where you have a really good sonic world that feels unique and you have a great melody or a hook or something that also feels unique and you get that together and it's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, Reagan, I guess do you have a follow up? Kind of... Go ahead, oh, sorry. go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. Um, I guess that just kind of leads into the other part of my question, which was um, when you make an original song for a movie or a, or a series, I guess, do you know who, what, who the artist is that you're gonna be working with on that original song as you're writing it? And does that affect how you write the song or is that something you have to write first they find the artist and then you have to tweak it uh everything is different it's a complete like head fuck to be honest it's like to <laughs> into songs you end up in a lot of politics there's so much politics to do with record labels to do with the film um yes you want like with hear my voice i started that off before i got involved with celeste and I was looking for the right person to do it with, and I really wanted her. And she said yes, which is amazing. I've just done a song with someone else who only knows who it is, but I can't say who it is because it's top secret. It's insane. I've just done a song with like it's pretty one, amazing, man. <laughs> one of the most um, like legendary people in the history of modern music, um, and that was an amazing experience. And I didn't go into writing that track originally thinking I would get that person. I just started writing this track and then they came on board and we worked together remotely and we've come up with something really cool. Um, and to be honest, 
I don't think there's one way of doing it. It's, you know, like if you've done a really banging hip hop track, don't try and get Celine Dion to, 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 to on it. It's not, gonna, not gonna work. Although I'm, I'm now like, yes, that's exactly what I wanna hear. I'm actually like, I'm now like, what am I talking about? That is actually a great idea. Uh, but, um, to be honest, it's kind of like the, the song side of things. It's it's so fraught with complexity with artists. Um, like I did this song for Ocean's Eight, okay, and um, I wrote the song with someone. It was going to be a big centerpiece of Ocean's Eight, and everyone. I do a lot of behind the scenes politics of like making sure everyone at Warner Brothers was on board with this idea, and they all were, and we've done a demo with person I wrote it with. But the idea was we were going to get a really big classic singer who'd been, let's say, around the block um, to sing it. Like, a, you know, someone who'd, who'd experienced life and was out the other side and was still killing it. And everyone was super excited. And we play it for the director and 20 seconds in, he's like, nah, this is a great song, but it's not going in my movie. And oh, you're like, yeah. shit. And <laughs> And it was just dead. Then it was just dead. It was gone. Um, and um, it's very, it's very tricky songs. But if you get them away, it's really good. And I think it's, I think the more connection there is to like the, the, uh, the score, or the better the world is. You, you're creating something unique. Again, it's always about creating something unique. If you're just putting a commercial pop song in that's good for marketing, everyone can tell that's like hokey. And I think if you want to do it for yourself, and I would say, don't worry about big name artists, get anyone, find someone with an interesting voice, find someone on YouTube, find like, like I did a track with Sam, this singer called Sam Lee, who's a folk singer for King Arthur. And he's, he's a great artist, but he's not that well known. Um, and that's the most popular track I've, you know, I've got on, on online. Um, I did a track for Rising Phoenix where I worked with three disabled rappers who I had no idea who they were. We tracked them down like because uh, uh, I wanted to work with disabled artists and they were absolutely phenomenal, like completely mind blowing, delivered something so good. And at one point we were talking about trying to go to a big name for this end credits of this thing. I'm so pleased like we didn't do that because we've got something far more unique. So I would say go find like someone you want to work with. Just like, there's so many people out there doing stuff. It doesn't need to be a big name. Like, I think again, there's a thing where it's like, there's so many big names doing things and they're not that, uh, that exciting often, apart from the track I've just done. Which is really good. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, just, just make a cool track and get someone interesting to sing on it. And then just mm -hmm. present it. I think the trouble with songs got presented to the director and they'll just be like, yay. Or they'll be like, like, what happened to me? I hate it. And it's gone. <laughs> and then it's gone. But mm -hmm. that song at one point was going to be covered by someone else. And then she pulled out. So it's still available. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. OK, so um, let me just check. Is there another question or? Um... Are we uh, are we coming to an end here? I think this may be a good time to wrap things up. We're about an hour and forty three minutes into the second stream, so um, we've had a, okay. we've, had a, we've had a long conversation here, and uh, um, yeah. Let me see if I can well, successfully uh, bring all of us into the frame here. Oh, good good look at that, uh, Daniel. I just want to tell you. How much I appreciate your time today, and I know um, all of us at UNT uh, really appreciate it. The students, uh, faculty, administration, and uh, thank you so much for uh, bearing with us here while we uh, while we work out the technical kinks. No problems. It's been uh, a fun experience. Excellent, excellent. Before before we say farewell, Daniel, I, I, there's a question that we're going to ask everyone, and I'm. I'm burning to your answer to it but I want to ask you what what you know you've been so welcoming and open about everything the process 
I'm just fascinated to know what you think the future of, of music and moving images with, you know, things like VR and the metaverse and augmented reality and God knows what else that we don't even know about coming down the pike. Where do you think we'll be in 20 or 30 years time? Um, I don't know. It's kind of part of me wonders, like film music is very linear. Um, and I do like linear I like the linear experience of like here is what you're gonna what you're gonna experience the like video games are like super fascinating storytelling devices which i've always thought for a very long time and i think i mean they are getting the credibility they deserve now but it's taken a very long time for people to wake up to that um um but the interactivity on those is still quite like tracks that fade one up and fade one down um and that's a whole different way of music it's like trying to work out things that, that musically will work and i still like linear storytelling and i wonder whether that will go out of fashion because i could see it i could see why if you've played a really exciting video game where you are James Bond, and you feel like you're James Bond. Watching a James Bond film where you're just watching some bloke run around from James Bond has probably become, become less exciting. Um, but then, how do you create those moments that, again, we talk about the moment? Um, I guess it's just it will, it will be a different um, device to do that. I, I, I worry a bit about the industrialization of, of film music. Um, which is definitely happening a lot and they kind of def definitely the streaming revolution having done some streaming shows it is all about quantity and quality often takes a knock in that um, and that is technology has obviously helped that happen um, but you know so much there that's like, sort of throw, like a throw away but it's like next 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 I, I i i slightly worry about that and the sort of like like i said industrialization where being a composer becomes more about managerial process of like having tons of other people who write your stuff and then you just kind of sign it off which i don't have i still just do everything myself in here in my messy flat um but you know, you, you know, we're talking about scores already that are like 30, 40 years old. And I think I think there's a lot of place to it. I think there's exciting, a lot of exciting new voices coming through. And I like the fact that film music's getting... Like, film music has been pretty much like middle-class white guys for like the last 50 years. It's like kind of quite shocking. And that's changing a teeny bit. Not as much as it should be, but um, it's changing a teeny bit. And that means hopefully we get more disparate experiences, disparate voices, disparate backgrounds. And that will just lead to richer, richer, um, richer, richer film and music experiences, I hope. So that's my optimistic, optimistic take on it. Well, that's great. And, and we are not so far into the future going to be having some of those different diverse voices, you know, on this show. Um, but till then, uh, I just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Music Motion, University of North Texas. Uh, it's been an incredible and fascinating interview. And I can't think of very many people at your level with your experience who would have been as open and as frank and as disarming and as intelligent and smart as you have been in this conversation we've learned, learned all sorts of things we've learned how to you know use anything at hand have anything as messy as my uh studio Oh, that's awesome. And I think it's been really inspiring that's that someone awesome. at your level is still, you know, playing music with a freaking bottle and a spoon. Trust me, it's like a secret. I've got my scores here. Starting a new score yep. on next week. I've got my, <laughs> my notes all printed out for my printer. Um, <laughs> I think the thing I feel best about, about my...
career, shall we say, is is the fact, hopefully, I've shown that you can have a very messy flat. You don't have to have a fancy setup with a room with like 20,000 like, like chain linked computers running the latest sample set. You can have a bottle, a microphone and a stick <laughs> and you can still get hired big blockbuster movies. Well, I don't really get hired from the big blockbuster ones, but you know, you can, you can, you can make film music. So. You do, and we are so sampling that clip for our, uh, to promote our next episode. Thank you okay. so much, Daniel Pemberton. All right. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, Drew. That was a fun experience. I'm going to go to sleep. All right. Thank you, See Daniel. you later. Cheers, mate. All right. Bye. Hey, Daniel. That was awesome. <laughs> that was That's fantastic. Uh, so uh, I, I, I genuinely I can't think of a more inspiring person for people starting in the industry than a guy with that experience playing a bottle in his studio. I, I agree. I agree. And uh, we're that's very consistent with what we're we're promoting here at the University of North Texas, kind of guerrilla guerrilla warfare um, uh, comp uh, composition. So um, it's so great to have him. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about what we have uh, for our next episode next month on March 27th? Yeah, on March, on, on March 27th, uh, I'm very excited to say that we are going to have Andy Milburn and Tom Hajdu, also known or better known as Tom and Andy. Uh, they are pioneers of electronic music in cinema. Um, and they're also pioneers in the horror and thriller genre in particular. Uh, they've done films like The Strangers, The Mothman Prophecies, Killing Zoe. Um, they are also uh, people who are deeply involved with the question I asked Daniel at the end here with the future of music in pioneering technologies that involve music and sound for a multiple of different applications, uh, exhibition spaces, uh, medical applications, uh, and I think it will prove to be a really fascinating conversation. So please join us for that. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. Um, and uh, for all of you who stuck with us all the way through, thank you. And uh, thanks for uh, enduring. Uh, our audience members, thank you for enduring a couple of glitches in the streaming. Um, we will have this sorted out. Uh, we'll have this dialed in um, in March. So uh, please come back on March 27th, 3 p.m. Uh, CST um, in the States. And... Um, yeah, I think uh, at this point, uh, Ali, I think we will go with the uh, the closing. We'll, we'll do our opening sequence as the closing sequence. And uh, we'll see you again soon, my friend. Thank you. Okay.